Hello and welcome to another teaching by 119 Ministries. Our ministry teaches that the whole Bible is true and applicable for our lives today. If you would like to know more about what we believe and teach, please visit us at testeverything.net. We hope that you enjoy studying and testing the following teaching. Proverbs chapter 30 verse 4. Who has ascended to heaven and come down? Who has gathered the wind in his fists? Who has wrapped up the waters in a garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his son's name? Surely you know. The Hebrew word Hashem literally means the name. This topic is likely one of the most dividing and emotionally loaded topics in what is commonly called Hebrew roots. In this teaching series, we will be exploring several questions, some of those being, why does the topic of our Creator's name cause so much division in the body? What's the Hebrew word for name really mean? What does it mean to profane His name? Why do people say Hashem instead of saying our Creator's name? What is our Creator's name? What is the Tetragrammaton? Why did LORD, in all caps, replace the Tetragrammaton in English Bibles? Why is it said that Yahweh was revealed in the Exodus? Is it wrong to say LORD? Can we pronounce our Creator's name correctly? If so, how or why not? What does it mean to transliterate names? Is it okay to transliterate names? What is our Messiah's name? Does the transliterated form of our Messiah's name as Jesus derive from the Greek god Zeus? What does it mean that we should not speak the names of other gods? This teaching has resulted from our own study on this subject. We encourage you to test what is said to His Word. It is possible that feedback from the body could cause us to consider insight which could necessitate adjusting and re-releasing this teaching in the future. We do not want to contribute to controversy, nor fuel unnecessary division resulting in the study of this subject. We certainly value seeking out truth and applying truth. But when it comes to correcting others in the body, we need to be sure that it is done with and for the right reasons. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 19. There are six things that Yahweh hates, seven that are an abomination to Him, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among brothers. We teach and follow the Word of God. Nowhere could we find any commandment in the Torah that states that one must fully understand how to spell or pronounce our Creator's name. We certainly believe that it is a blessing to know how to spell and pronounce His name, if it is even possible to determine today with absolute accuracy. Those that argue and divide on how to spell or pronounce His name are guiltier of sowing discord versus edifying the body of the Messiah. In fact, anyone overly focused on the spelling or pronunciation of our Creator's name has missed the whole point of what name, or Shem, in Hebrew primarily means in the first place. We are not saying there is not a degree of value in knowing how to spell or pronounce our Creator's name. However, the higher importance is properly defining and applying the Hebrew word Shem. The word Shem means much more than just a name. A related word in Hebrew is the word Neshama, meaning breath. In the Hebrew mind, the breath is much more than the exchange of air in the lungs, but was the seat of one's character. The word Shem is also used in the manner as seen in this passage where the word fame is the Hebrew word Shem. 1 Kings chapter 4 For he was wiser than all other men, wiser than Ethan the Ezraite, and Haman, Kalkol, and Darda the sons of Mahal, and his fame was in all the surrounding nations. This is similar to our desire to have a good name. This has nothing to do with the actual name but the character of the one with the name. When we see a name such as King David, we see the word king as a title and David as a name. In our Western mind, a title refers to a character trait or authority while name is simply denoting identity. 
In westernized thinking, the name portraying identity is related to the spelling and pronunciation of the assigned name. That is all that it means, and that is what is determined to be important. In Hebrew thinking, a name, or Shem, denotes the character, authority, reputation, and even purpose of an individual. And then it is the character, authority, reputation, and purpose of the individual that comprises of and yields one's identity. Did you see the difference? Much of the arguing about our Creator's name is a symptom of westernized thinking, promoting the usage of Shem to denote and highlight identity, when the true purpose of Shem is to denote character, authority, etc. In the Hebrew language, there is no distinction between names and titles. Both the words King and David are descriptions of character traits. King is one who reigns, while David is one who is loved. Because of westernized thinking, it is also common to identify the word Elohim as a title and Yahweh as an identifying name. What we do not often realize is that both of these are character traits. Yahweh means the one who exists, and Elohim is plural magistrate with power and authority. This means that our Creator has many names. Though it is evident that there is a particular Shem that our Creator certainly wishes to emphasize, and we'll discuss that later in the series. As already mentioned, the Hebrew word Shem more literally means character and authority. There is also an element of fame or glory attached to it, meaning reputation. Although the Western mindset often treats the word name to simply be an identifier, to a degree, name in the English can also denote the Hebraic understanding or application of character and or authority. For example, perhaps you have heard of these phrases, in the name of love, in the name of the king, to tarnish one's name. You give love a bad name. Call someone names, by the name of. I can't put a name to it. In name only, my name is Mud. You name it. As you can see, these have nothing to do with the spelling or pronunciation, but more to do with the character, authority, or reputation of something. To illustrate this, we'll examine some scripture that contains Shem and determine how it is used. Shem as reputation and character. The reputation of Eve is that she is the mother of all living. Thus, that determined her Shem. Genesis chapter 3, verse 20. And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. The reputation of Babel is that it is confusing or mixing. That is what Babel literally means and where the name Babylon comes from. To come out of Babylon means to come out of confusion or the mixing of ways. Thus, the opposite of being in Babylon is to repent and be in the Torah or the Word of God. Genesis chapter 11, verse 9. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. The tower in Babel was intended to give the city a reputation or glory that would be known. Genesis 11. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. The reputation or character or authority of Abraham was to be great. Genesis chapter 12. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. When we banner our Creator as our Master, we carry His reputation and character by what we do. When we obey the Torah, we give glory to our Creator. When we disobey, we make His character and authority out to be worthless in our lives. Numbers chapter 6. So shall they put my name upon the people of Israel, and I will bless them. We swear on the reputation and character of His Shem, His name. When we are guilty of breaking an oath or a promise, this reflects not only negatively on us, but the character of our Creator which we publicly profess to emulate in our faith. This begins to lead into what it really means to profane His name, which we'll discuss more later. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 20. You shall fear Yahweh your God, you shall serve Him and hold fast to Him, and by His name you shall swear. Here are some more examples of Shem referring to reputation. 
Deuteronomy chapter 22, and accuses her of misconduct and brings a bad name upon her, saying, I took this woman, and when I came near her, I did not find in her evidence of virginity. Deuteronomy chapter 25, and the name of his house shall be called in Israel, the house of him who had his sandal pulled off. Deuteronomy 28, if you are not careful to do all the words of this law that are written in this book, that you may fear this glorious and awesome name, Yahweh your God. 1 Samuel 12, for Yahweh will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it has pleased Yahweh to make you a people for himself. 2 Samuel chapter 8, and David made a name for himself when he returned from striking down 18,000 Edomites in the Valley of Salt. That serves as enough examples to illustrate how Shem denotes an understanding of the character or reputation. It is then through that character or reputation that identity is revealed. That is the Hebraic application. Identity is not necessarily revealed in the spelling or pronunciation. Again, this is not to say that spelling or pronunciation has no value. The point is that the higher value should be placed on the literal Hebraic application of the word Shem, which constitutes as defining the identity through the character and reputation of something. Name as authority. Abram called upon the authority of Yahweh. Does this specifically mean that Abram spelled and pronounced our Creator's name correctly? No. While it is likely that he did, this is expressed in Abraham calling upon the authority of our Creator. Genesis 13. And there, Abram called upon the name of Yahweh. The messenger of Exodus 23 contained the authority of Yahweh. Exodus 23. Pay careful attention to him and obey his voice. Do not rebel against him, for he will not pardon your transgression, for my name is in him. When it is stated that the name will be erased from memory, or something to that effect, it is not the literal name that is being referenced. It is the respect of authority that is being dissolved. For example, Deuteronomy chapter 7. And he will give their kings into your hand, and you shall make their name perish from under heaven. No one shall be able to stand against you until you have destroyed them. Deuteronomy chapter 9. Let me alone, that I may destroy them and blot out their name from under heaven. And I will make of you a nation mightier and greater than they. Deuteronomy chapter 12. You shall tear down their altars and dash in pieces their pillars and burn the ashram with fire. You shall chop down the carved images of their gods and destroy their name out of that place. Deuteronomy chapter 29. Yahweh will not be willing to forgive him, but rather the anger of Yahweh and his jealousy will smoke against that man, and the curses written in this book will settle upon him, and Yahweh will blot out his name from under heaven. Deuteronomy chapter 12. But you shall seek the place that Yahweh your God will choose out of all your tribes to put his name, and make his habitation there. There you shall go. Deuteronomy chapter 12. Then the place that Yahweh your God will choose to make his name dwell there, you shall bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings and your sacrifices, your tithes and contribution that you present, and all your finest vow offerings that you vow to Yahweh. Here's some more interesting verses as Shem as authority. Deuteronomy chapter 18. For Yahweh your God has chosen him out of all your tribes to stand and minister in the name of Yahweh, him and his sons for all time. Deuteronomy 18. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, that I have not commanded him to speak, or speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, how may we know the word that Yahweh has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of Yahweh, if the word does not come to pass or come true, it is a word that Yahweh has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. Deuteronomy 21. Then the priests of the sons of Levi shall come forward, for Yahweh your God has chosen them to minister to him and bless in the name of Yahweh, and by their word every dispute and every assault shall be settled. Deuteronomy 28. And all the peoples of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of Yahweh, and they shall be afraid of you. Deuteronomy 32. For I will proclaim the name of Yahweh, ascribe greatness to our God. Often in the Tanakh, Shem denotes all aspects of its literal usage. Reputation, character, and authority. 
2 Samuel chapter 22. For this I will praise you, O Yahweh, among the nations, and sing praises to your name. 1 Kings 5. And so I intend to build a house for the name of Yahweh my God, as Yahweh said to David my father, Your son, whom I will set on your throne in your place, shall build the house for my name. 1 Kings 8. Now it was the heart of David my father to build a house for the name of Yahweh, the God of Israel. 1 Kings 8. Likewise, when a foreigner who is not your people Israel comes from a far country for your name's sake. When the Bible speaks of taking God's name to the nations, he is not talking about the name itself, but his character. Profaning the name. When the command to not take God's name in vain literally means not to represent his character in a false manner, it is similar to our expression of having a good name which is not about the name itself, but the character of the one with that name. Exodus 20. You shall not take the name of Yahweh your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Deuteronomy chapter 5. You shall not take the name of Yahweh your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. This has nothing to do with saying God in the context of any statement you might make. This mentality is what originated the Jewish tradition of a hyphenated form of God as G hyphen D. The idea is that it is a form of respect. Though we fully believe we should show every ounce of respect to our Creator, this tradition is not found in the Scriptures in any capacity. It is not even suggested in Scripture that our Creator interprets it as a sign of respect. It is simply following the traditions of man. This does not inherently mean that it is bad but we should recognize where the practice came from and who we are following with such a practice. It becomes Mark 7 territory when others begin compelling and correcting others to follow such traditions of men. Taking Yahweh's name in vain has nothing to do with how many times you might say Yahweh or however you might pronounce yod heh vav -Heh yourself. There is a Jewish tradition of saying Hashem in the place of reading Yahweh in the scriptures. The primary reason for this is because it is believed that if the name is repeated too often, that it will make his name common and thus profane his name. If our Creator was really concerned with such things, he would not have written out Yahweh in the Tanakh nearly 7,000 times. Taking our Creator's name in vain should be interpreted in the way of the literal understanding of Shem, which we already covered. Exodus 20, you shall not take the name of Yahweh your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. When we disobey the Torah, we profane or make worthless our Creator's authority. We stop all over it and declare his authority meaningless in our lives with our disobedience. This is exactly what it means. It is already defined for us in His Word. For example, the worshiping of false gods destroys and makes worthless the authority of Yahweh. Leviticus 18. You shall not give any of your children to offer them to Molech, and so profane the name of your God, I am Yahweh. When we swear falsely, that makes worthless the authority of Yahweh. Leviticus 19. You shall not swear by my name falsely, and so profane the name of your God. I am Yahweh. What this means is that our yeses should be yes, and our noes should be no. Not by just what we say, by what also we do. We should do what we say. If we don't, we make our promises worthless. And since we wear the Yahweh t-shirt to the world, it makes Yahweh's authority and reputation appear worthless to the world. Israel, specifically the Levites in this example, are to be set apart to Yahweh. They are to do set-apart things in set-apart ways. Leviticus 21. They shall be holy to their God and not profane the name of their God. For they offer Yahweh's food offerings, the bread of their God, therefore they shall be holy. Knowing the name. What does it mean to know the name? Does it mean to know how to spell and pronounce the name? Or something else? Exodus chapter 6. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, as God Almighty, but by my name, Yahweh, I did not make myself known to them. What does this mean? Abraham knew this Shem as Yahweh. Genesis chapter 16, 
But Abram said, O Yahweh God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Abram knew how to literally pronounce and spell Yahweh. But Yahweh stated that he did not reveal his Shem of Yahweh to him. This is further evidence that our Creator is not referencing the spelling and pronunciation of His name. He is referring to a full revealing of His character and authority. Yahweh's character, reputation, and authority was fully revealed with the Passover of Exodus, a character of grace, demonstrating His power at the Red Sea, reputation, and delivering His Torah at Sinai, His authority. Knowing Yahweh's name is not about spelling and pronunciation. It's about knowing the character, reputation, and authority of our Creator. Psalm 9, verse 10. And those who know your name, Shem, put their trust in you. For you, O Yahweh, have not forsaken those who seek you. Isaiah 52. Now therefore, what I have here, declares Yahweh, seeing that my peoples are taken away for nothing, their rulers wail, declares Yahweh. And continually all the day my name is despised. Therefore my people shall know my name, Shem. Therefore in that day they shall know that it is I who speak. Here I am. The verses following this verse speak of good news, happiness, and salvation as the Shem they shall know. Jeremiah chapter 16. Therefore, behold, I will make them know. This once I will make them know my power and my might, and they shall know my name is Yahweh. Ezekiel chapter 39. And my holy name, Shem, I will make known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let my holy name be profaned any more, and the nation shall know that I am Yahweh, the Holy One in Israel. The Pharaoh of Egypt literally knew how to spell and pronounce our Creator's name as Yahweh. And how well did it work out for him? Exodus chapter 8. Then Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron and said, Plead with Yahweh to take away the frogs from me and my people, and I will let the people go to sacrifice to Yahweh. What the Pharaoh did not know, recognize, and apply was the character, reputation, and authority of our Creator. And that was his downfall. Knowing how to spell and pronounce his name did nothing for him. That all being said, we would like to take time to encourage others to not harshly rebuke or correct others in an effort to promote different understandings of how to spell and pronounce our Creator's name. Civil and edifying discussion is healthy, but not at the expense of dividing and discouraging the body. Promote the following of His Torah so that His real Shem will be known by all of the nations. That concludes this portion of the series of Hashem. Here are some of the topics we still need to cover in subsequent teachings in this series. What is our Creator's name? What is the Tetragrammaton? Why did Lord replace the Tetragrammaton in the English Bibles? Why is it said that Yahweh was revealed in the Exodus? Is it wrong to say Lord? Can we pronounce our Creator's name correctly? If so, how or why not? What does it mean to transliterate names? Is it okay to transliterate names? What is our Messiah's name? Does the transliterated form our Messiah's name as Jesus derive from the Greek god Zeus? What does it mean that we should not speak the names of other gods? We hope that this teaching has blessed you. And remember, continue to test everything. Shalom. Christmas and Easter, two days esteemed above most others and are observed by nearly one-third of the human population. Millions of believers worldwide celebrate these holidays to honor the birth, death, and resurrection of the Messiah. These festivals take many cultural forms and shapes around the world. But would you be alarmed to discover that these two seemingly innocent holidays are historically rooted in ancient occult practices which can be traced back to Babylon? Babylonian sun god worship has evolved throughout the centuries and has branched out into several major religions. Many professing believers have also adopted several of these pagan customs unaware. 
Even today, all throughout Catholicism and daughter denominations, there are still dozens of popular monuments and symbols that were at one time dedicated to various sun gods. What became this very same organization also instituted Christmas and Easter. Secular and Christian scholars alike all record that the Christmas tree, wreaths, boughs of holly, and mistletoe were all objects used in pagan sun god fertility rites. This, of course, begs the question, what are they doing in the homes of believers today? Discover how Mithra and the Norse Odin evolved into the imaginary saint we know today as Nicholas and how he became the key figure in the celebration of Christmas. In ancient folklore, Saint Nicholas was accompanied by a dark counterpart known as the Krampus and had a striking resemblance to other false deities. The Easter Bunny and the dying of Easter eggs are also symbols of fertility connected to Ishtar, biblically referenced as the Queen of Heaven. Long before the birth of our Messiah, December 25th was a day used to celebrate the rebirth of the Sun God. All of this and more has all been justified by man for hundreds of years. But when was the last time we considered what our Creator had to say regarding all of this? Do we care? Should we care? We reveal an opportunity and faith-centered challenge to worship and practice the faith as He stated He desires for all His people, not according to us, not according to men, but instead according to His way, according to His Word. That is, if you are ready to test everything. To order this two-part teaching, visit testeverything.net or watch it for free in our video section. It is because of you, our generous supporters, who make it possible to offer these high-quality teachings completely free of charge. If you feel led to support 119 Ministries so that we can continue this effort, please visit testeverything.net and click on the Support 119 tab. Learn how you can partner with us to take the whole Word of God to the nations.